please welcome to the stage Jeff Magian Calda, Chief Executive Officer, Coursera. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to our learners, our customers, and our partners all around the world. And a warm welcome to some of our longest standing partners and friends who have flown in from London, from Hong Kong, from Chile, to be with us here in California today. I'm Jeff Magincalda. I'm excited to welcome you to Coursera Conference 2023. And we're taking on a big topic, the future of learning and work. What we're gonna talk about in the next 60 or so minutes is the way that the world is changing, some of the challenges that that presents, and some of the opportunities that we have to really make a difference in creating more equal opportunity for more people around the world. I like to ground ourselves to start with these. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. They were created in 2015 to help us understand and plan for a world of human prosperity in a world where we protect the planet. And I'm probably biased, and I think many of my colleagues here are biased as well, in thinking that one of these sustainable development goals, quality education, really is a source for progress against all the others. Because education really is the way, through cultures and through ages, that we've advanced as a society and we've moved humanity forward. I love my job. Uh, I love thinking about and talking about and learning about the future of work and the future of learning. And one of my favorite things to do as a steward of our partners' brands and content and credential is to promote the opportunities that are now available and to go around the world understanding firsthand what the challenges are that are arising and what some of the emerging solutions look like as well. In the last six months, I've had the privilege to work in more than 30 cities, more than 20 countries. I get to spend time in the UAE. I get to spend time in Hungary. I get to spend time, this is in Lima, Peru, talking to students and faculty about what, what is changing in higher education and also what is changing for the students in the job opportunities ahead of them. I get to spend time in Morocco. This is a group of students in Delhi, India, who are all in online degree programs that our university partners host on Coursera. We listen to them, what their experience is like, how we can do better at Coursera in serving them, and how our partners might bring more degrees online to serve their needs better. And then this one is uh, one of my favorite pictures. This is actually a dinner, a team dinner that we had in Coursera in Singapore, where the waiter heard us all talking, found out that we were from Coursera, and said, I'm taking the University of Michigan programming in Python class. And then between each course, handed business cards to each of us saying, when I graduate, can I get a job at Coursera? So really, it has been extremely exciting, and it's an exciting time. In January, I was able to spend time in Davos, and everybody was talking about chat GPT. When I got there on Sunday, not so much. By the time I left on Thursday, it was the talk of the town. And now, across the media, across the world, people are talking about, at a global level, the impact that this new generative AI technology is gonna have on jobs, on the way that we think, the way we do research, what's gonna be happening on college campuses, and this one in CBS, this was actually an article about me where they were asking me how I was using ChatGPT. And you know, I've been a little bit obsessed. I use it as a writing assistant. I use it as a thought partner. It is changing the job of the CEO. It's gonna change almost every job in the world. So this is a chart that many of you have seen. I've shown this many times. It basically looks at the risk of automation for certain kinds of jobs. And what you can see in the lower right here are these large red bubbles. These are jobs held by lower wage, less skilled employees who typically don't have any formal education, who have job tasks that are typically more repeatable and more predictable, and therefore more likely to be automated because of technology. Now you'll notice up here in the upper left, these blue bubbles, higher wage jobs, less predictable, historically less likely to be automated uh, by, by technology, and our job collectively is to make sure that we provide more equal access to the knowledge and the skills and the credentials so that everybody has a chance 
to get those new opportunities that are being created because of technology. I showed this a year ago, and things have changed quite a bit. The jobs of the future is much more of a moving target than it used to be. There's now quite a bit of research suggesting that the new class of AI is going to affect and impact a much, much broader population of workers. In fact, on March 27th, just a couple weeks ago, OpenAI and University of Pennsylvania published a fairly comprehensive study on the expected impact of ChatGPT4 on job roles. And what they found is about half of jobs will have half of tasks and activities exposed to uh, OpenAI's GPT-4. And interestingly, higher wage positions are more exposed to this new generative AI technology than lower wage positions. A way to think about it is right here. If you go back to 2016 and you say, what was the state of AI back in 2016? This is according to the, the OECD. And you said, well, what kinds of job activities can be automated using AI that existed in 2016 and then rank the typical ed education level that would be most impacted by that technology, it basically went from top to bottom. Most vulnerable are those with no formal education, least vulnerable those with college degrees. Fast forward to 2023 and GPT-4 and this research that comes out from OpenAI and UPenn, we see a total reshuffling of exposure of job titles and education levels to this new class of AI. Now, the jobs that are most exposed to this new technology are jobs held by those with college degrees. The jobs least exposed to GPT-4 are those that are held by people generally with less formal education. So it's somewhat poetic. The people who got these advanced degrees have built technology that now makes us all vulnerable to job automation we're all in the same boat. We're all going to have to figure out not just where the world's going, but how we can adapt and change and learn throughout our lives to be ready for whatever comes next. I thought Her Excellency Shama's points about having a river and not knowing where the future is going to go are spot on. We must build a more agile learning system. We must create more equal access to learning because that will be the path to success wherever the future takes us. So you might be saying, well, what's safe? What should we learn? What skills are going to be future-proof? We don't know for sure, but this is a study that was done by McKinsey. They looked at human skills and said, which ones are going to be most future-proof? They organized them by interpersonal, self-leadership, cognitive, and digital. Here are the skills that they believe are less likely to be automated. Empathy, negotiating, problem solving, ability to learn. Here are the skills that are top predictors of higher income. Here are skills that are predictors of job satisfaction. Notice, coping with uncertainty, pretty key skill for all of us going forward. Here are some of the skills that are the top predictors of employment. Coping with uncertainty, adaptability, synthesizing messages. So human skills will become more and more important in a world where technology is not only automating the predictable tasks, but also a lot of the knowledge and cognitive related tasks that we have previously thought we're going to be a little bit immune to technology. So what do we do about this? Like, how do we respond to a world that is changing so quickly? I would argue we take the challenge and understand it as an opportunity. The World Economic Forum puts out five factors of social mobility, technology, education, health, jobs, and institutions. And the way that we see it is technology is fundamentally reshaping the way we learn, not only in terms of access, but you'll see here We'll show you some demos of how we're building ChatGPT into the learning experience. We're going to be seeing a learning experience online that will be far more personalized and far more interactive and far more relevant than any kind of learning that we have seen online before. So totally different possibilities open up with technology and education. And as I'll lay out in this keynote as well, technology is changing the way we work. Not just the jobs that are in demand and the tasks that need to be performed, but where, who, when these jobs can be performed. And hybrid and remote work are creating an incredible global set of opportunities so that people anywhere will have a better chance to get jobs in a different city, in a different state, even in a different country. And the role that institutions play is to make sure that we afford people 
the, the new promising opportunities that are created in education and also in terms of jobs. So here's a chart that shows investment in technology by educational institutions. Uh, this was also done by the OECD where they asked 33 countries post pandemic, are you going to maintain or invest or actually pull back on investing in technology? Notice the top three, virtually 100% of countries at the federal level or the state level said, we will maintain or increase our investment in digital tools on campus. We will maintain or increase the use of digital technology, remote learning, distance learning. And then the number one, every single country said, we have to figure out hybrid, the combination of teaching students on campus while also teaching students online. So, the world really is hybrid. It will be basically supported by technology in learning and also technology in work. When we look at the role that technology is playing in the kinds of jobs that are in most demand, this is a list from LinkedIn. You can see digital jobs are in more demand. And look at the percentage of jobs that are now being offered remotely. It is exactly those higher demand, better paying jobs that are generally higher skilled that are more likely gonna be offered and are being offered as remote work positions. This creates a much more equal set of opportunities for people who have those skills to get those kinds of jobs. Here's some data from LinkedIn on job postings and job applications for remote work jobs. Now you can see in 2020, before the pandemic, pretty small. Obviously, the number of job postings, these are the dark blue bars, has grown during the pandemic. It's fallen a bit as employers try to pull people back to the office. But look at the light blue bars. These are job applications. They continue to grow. There are four times as many people looking for a remote work job than there are job postings. And for any employer who says it's tough to find qualified talent, I ask, are you looking globally? Because the number of young people now getting access to really good education and really powerful credentials and the skills and knowledge to do these kinds of jobs that are in very high demand is global. It is no longer constrained just to a certain region. So employers increasingly will be looking for talent globally and students increasingly will see global opportunity. Now, remote work affects different people differently. The demand among men and women for um, remote work jobs is, has been growing. But in particular, this is according to a McKinsey study, over 60% of women surveyed said that they would prefer mostly to work remotely. Why? Because they say it increases their productivity, it allows them to stay in the workforce, and it improves their performance at work. So for any company saying, I'm gonna pull everybody back to the office, we should realize those types of work policies have a different impact on different people. And if we really wanna build inclusive workforces, if we really wanna build at all layers of the organization a more diverse population, Think seriously as an employer about what your work policies are, who you will attract, and how you will support people as they grow through your organization. It's not just women. Remote work opportunities also increases the diversity of job applicants. It increases the diversity of hires. And importantly, it increases the retention of underrepresented groups. Again, any employer who's saying you must come back to the office, I would say, watch carefully how the demographics of your workforce change. So not only is there a much wider population when you go more globally, it is also a more diverse po population of talent that is available to employers who are really embracing online, hybrid, and remote work. This chart basically shows where is the remote work hiring happening. The fastest rate of growth in remote work jobs is not happening in North America, it's not happening in Europe, it's happening in Latin America followed by India and Southeast Asia. There is now a global talent pool available for employers who are building increasingly global workforces. And what we see, and I see this firsthand when I travel, is that at, so at software engineering, which is often a remote work job, uh, the employees say that on average they make almost 30% more when they work for a global company than for a local one. Now, you talk to students in Hungary, you talk to students in Lima, you talk to students in Kuala Lumpur, they're pretty excited. They can see a much, much bigger world of opportunity than their parents saw. You talk to the CHROs, the heads of HR, who are hiring these uh, software engineers all around the world, and they're saying, 
Now I'm competing against compensation packages and against employers who aren't even in my country. And so employers are having to recognize that it's not just through compensation, but it's through connection to the purpose of the company, it's connection to the people of the company, it's the environment and the kinds of work that people get to do, and the investment that employers make in their employees that is gonna be an important part of retaining talent. But retaining talent is one of the top priorities that I hear in this more global talent pool. So that's a little bit of a background on what's happening in the world. Let's now zoom in on Coursera and our ecosystem of partners and talk about some of the progress that we're making. We, most of us know Coursera was started back in 2012 by Andrew Ng and Daphne Kohler, two professors from Stanford. They taught computer science, put some courses up on the internet and hundreds of thousands of people came to take these courses. It was the beginning of the MOOC revolution. Today there's over 115 million learners registered on Coursera from all around the world. 80% of them are outside the United States. And now we have more than 300 educator partners, both university partners and industry partners who are creating world-class content and credentials that are available to learners on a global basis. We've also really expanded how we serve learners. So initially it was just directly to individuals. Now we also offer our partners content and credentials through institutions. In 2015, we launched Coursera for Business to help businesses upskill and reskill their employees. A year later, we launched Coursera for Government to help public sector workers and also allow governments to do at more scale workforce development programs. And then in 2019, October, four months before a global pandemic, we launched Coursera for Campus with some of you who are in the room today. This allows any educational institution, college, university, vocational school, high schools, to integrate online content into their curriculum to make sure that their learners have the best learning that's available and are most ready when they graduate to pursue the life and the career that they're interested in. Now what I'm gonna talk about in the keynote coming up, I don't wanna to give too much of it away, is this final side of the triangle. How can we connect learners not just to education, but how can we connect learners to job opportunities, especially in a world where those job opportunities are glowing, uh, going more global. But we'll get to that in just a moment. Let's first zoom in on learners and talk a little bit about the progress that we've been making in serving learners. Not surprisingly, during the pandemic in 2020, we saw a huge jump in registered learners. We saw a huge jump globally in number of course enrollments. Post pandemic, that is not really going away. I mean, it slowed a bit, but it continues to grow at a very steady rate of about 20 million learners per year. And these learners are spread around the world and growing fastest where we have more emerging economies and younger talent pools. So we see in India as of the end of the year, about 19 million registered learners on Coursera, almost more learners in India than in all of Europe. And I think probably in the next 12 months or so, India will have more learners on Coursera than all the countries in Europe. And given the population and the growth rate and youth, we expect that's gonna continue. When we look at making our partners courses accessible, we see really huge promise in technology as machine translation into multiple languages. So by the middle of the year, we expect to have about 2000 courses fully translated into at least seven languages. Generally rule of thumb, it costs about 10,000, a little bit more than $10,000 per course to have humans translate the full courses. Machines can now do that for about $20 per course. Now the quality isn't quite there for every language course pair, but it is, incre it is improving rapidly. And we believe by the end of the year, we'll have the majority of our courses translated into the majority of languages so that learners all around the world can benefit from the industry partners and the university partners who put content and credentials onto Coursera. We talked a little bit about the benefits of remote work for women versus men. I just wanted to sort of zoom in quickly on a study that was done by the International Finance Corporation and the World Bank who interviewed 14,000 learners on Coursera to understand more about why they were learning online and the role that this online learning played. You can see for men and women, flexible scheduling was number one by far, just the flexibility to learn when I want, learn what I want, learn where I want. But the big difference between men and women comes down to basically three categories. Women said more than men, online learning is safer, it helps me deal with commute challenges, sometimes when there's only one source of transportation in a family, 
And often, usually, women are trying to balance family obligations even as they learn. What we've seen post-pandemic is a steady increase in the, in the uh, gender equity between course enrollments from men and women on Coursera. On a global basis, it's about 42% women. It's about 58% men. In the US, it's about 50-50. Of course, we're trying to drive this to 50-50 on a global basis. In that IFC report that I mentioned, 45% of women and 60% of women caregivers said that they would have to either stop or postpone their studies if they did not have online learning available. So clearly, online learning is a major source of access to learning opportunity and economic opportunity around the world. We just completed a 2023 learner outcome survey where we surveyed more than 50,000 learners who took our partners' content and credentials on Coursera. And what we heard was that more than three out of four said that learning on Coursera benefited their career. 28% who took entry-level professional certificates said they got a new job. And 30% of those who were studying who were unemployed when they filled out the survey said that they were employed after having learned. So we're really thrilled by the impact that this makes at scale. And I'd love to now feature a learner and in her own voice describe what it has meant for her to have access to one of our top partners, Google, who has made certain certificate programs available. Let's take a look. I, I don't even have words to describe my experience with Coursera because it gave me everything in my life. So Yesha, when initially she told me she wants to be a designer, I was genuinely thrilled. It felt like uh, she would be perfect for it. For the course, emotionally, I was very broken, you know, uh, failing multiple times, doing nothing in my life. But after the course, it changed everything. I have got the life which I always desired for, and that's what changed it. We interviewed Bhavishya, mm -hmm. and he had a few things to say. So uh, there's an iPad next to you. you wow, can, really? Yeah, have a look at it and uh, let us know what you think. Yeah, sure. Would love to. She was extremely. Uh, passionate about what she was doing and seeing her passion and seeing this passion ignite in her made me extremely proud. I, I felt like uh, she finally has found her calling. This was very cute. <laughs> well, it's all true. <laughs> so I, I, we have a, our, in our corporate values, our number one value is learners first. We start every all hands every two weeks with a learner story just to remind us like why we're here and the difference we're making, not just at scale, but in, in individual lives. So we've clearly together had a huge impact. And like I said, technology is opening up totally new opportunities to go even further in delivering a better learner experience for every learner that touches the uh, material, the content, the credentials uh, from our partners on the platform. And now what I'd like to do is to give a little preview of ChatGPT and how we're basically building in generative AI technology to make the learning experience for learners more personalized and more interactive than what we have seen before. And I'm excited to welcome Melody, one of our top product managers to the stage. Thank Melody, you. hello. Hi. Thank you for joining me. Super excited to be here. And so, you know, everyone's talking about ChatGPT. Yes. I'm talking about ChatGPT. <laughs> you and the team are actually building this into the learning experience. What are we gonna see here? Absolutely. As Jeff shared earlier, we do serve learners from very diverse background around the world. To them, learning on Coursera is not a linear journey. Everyone has a unique path filled with their own questions, reflections, and explorations. That's why we built Coursera Coach, our latest personalized and interactive learning experience, leveraging the power of generative AI to make learning more engaging and relevant. Now, let's see a quick demo of the first version. All right, Melly, let's take a look. More than 100 million learners benefit from online learning on Coursera and love the flexibility to learn on their own. But sometimes they also want to be able to tap someone on the shoulder to ask questions, like with a human coach. Tony is one of these learners who would like some help progressing in a project management course. She's learned about the SROM framework, commonly used to manage risks in a project. But she's stuck on this question. Why is there a difference between mitigating and resolving a risk? They sound pretty similar, don't they? Coursera Coach is available in the course, so Tony can ask her question directly there. 
In the past, Tommy would have to post this question in a discussion forum, or search the internet. But that takes a while, and she may still not find an answer that she can trust. With Coach, Tony is able to get a quick and clear answer without having to leave the page. Coach acknowledges Tony's question in a friendly way and understands the context. She's asking about the Rome framework. Coach also provides a concrete example on how to apply this framework in a real-world scenario. Tony now feels much more confident and continues her learning journey with Coach by her side. Learners' confidence and trust are very important to us at Coursera. We designed Coach to respond to learners' question based on credible content from top universities and industry partners on Coursera. Through Coach, learners can personalize how they interact with the learning content and get straight to what's most relevant to their goals. Let's see an example of how Coach helps an enterprise learner quickly solve her challenges at work. Leslie recently joined an edtech company as a data science manager. Her team is overwhelmed by the changing landscape of AI, and she wants to help her team better navigate these changes. Leslie is enrolled in a leadership course on Coursera, and this lecture actually covers how to navigate change. She has been so busy at work, so she asked Coach for a quick summary of the lecture to help her refresh her memory. Here are five key takeaways. Confirming Leslie's focus on building a team culture for change. The last point around recognizing emotions really stands out to Leslie. She realizes that she hasn't done enough there, so she follows up and asks how she could do more as a data science leader in the edtech industry. Coach is able to provide a list of actions on how to help her team feel less overwhelmed. The ideas and examples in the response are directly related to her team's day-to-day -day work and her company mission. So it becomes so much easier for Leslie to incorporate the learnings into how she interacts with her team. Leslie thanks Coach for making her learnings so much more actionable within a few conversations, and she's inspired to learn more. For example, how to better manage a remote team. Coach gives Leslie some helpful tips, and even offers some relevant clips in case she's curious to dig deeper. These are great suggestions. Leslie is excited to continue learning on Coursera and become a better leader for her team. All right, Melody. So we're clearly at the beginning of something yes. big. Where do you see this going from here? Absolutely. We're just so excited to see more learners like Tony and Leslie receive personalized support and guidance at the moment when they need it. Our vision is for Coursera Coach to empower learners at every step of their career journeys. Over time, Coach will also support learners in discovering new learning programs, getting career guidance, or building confidence with interviews. So we uh, are very excited about the vision and also excited to share this with more learners Great. in the next couple of months. On that note, I'm sure we have thousands of learners out there. They're saying, where's Coach? I want some help with yep. this. When can people actually start using this? Uh, absolutely. So we are actively testing Coach internally and following a set of principles for responsible AI. And we will start rolling it out to a small base of learners within the next couple of weeks. Within the next couple of weeks. Yes. All right, well, looking forward to it. Melody, thank you so much for joining thank me. Thank you. Okay. All right, so there's a little bit about how this new generative AI technology can change the way that people learn. We're at the very, very beginnings of this new era. Let's now shift to educators and what some of the progress that we've been seeing in the educator space, some incredible innovations among our industry partners and our university partners, and then we'll take a, take a little look at how technology will change the way that educators can create content. Uh, today, we partner with more than 185 universities all around the world. In the last year, we announced nine new university partnerships, again, on a pretty global basis. And today, I'm excited to announce five new university partners, uh, one in particular, Anahuac University. I met with uh, the, the rector down in Merida, Mexico, just a few months ago. We're excited to have the network uh, of Anahuac University on the Coursera platform offering content to those in Latin America and, and, and globally, uh, Ball State University, Illinois Institute of Technology, 
the London Business School, and the SP Jane Institute of Management and Research are all going to be joining and creating content and credentials for learners on Coursera. So for our new university partners, welcome. When we look at the industry partner side of the ledger, today we have more than 100 industry partners who offer content and, and help teach people, learners around the world on Coursera. Generally speaking, these industry partners are closer to the technology, the platforms, the tools, and particular jobs and careers that they can help skill for. In the last year, we announced 25 new industry partners across a domain of different industries. And today I'm excited to announce an additional 11 industry partners who will be creating content and credentials for learners around the world on Coursera. And you can see, again, a wide range of industries from pharmaceutical, technology, retail, and even real estate. When we think about Coursera, I mentioned we are the stewards of the brands, the reputation, the quality content, and the quality credentials of the top university institutions and the top business institutions in the world we want to make sure that we are a trusted place to come for the most trusted expertise in the world. So we think of Coursera as a gateway to the most authoritative, trusted experts that anyone has access to. And our job together is to make this access available on an equal and global basis. Part of expanding access includes expanding the different formats that are offered. So last year, we announced Clips. It's been a huge success. This is the ability for a learner to take just a five or 10 minute video clip that's inside of a course. Inside the 5,800 courses that our partners have created are about 250,000 clips, 200,000 of which learners can access on a you know, clip by clip basis. And I'd like to zero in a little bit on two types of formats that have been getting a lot of innovation lately. One is professional certificates and the other is college degrees. Turning first to professional certificates, we just concluded a global survey of students, employers, and also universities asking about their perceptions of what people are now calling industry micro-credentials. These are basically career and job-aligned professional certificates that teach people the skills and the knowledge and the tools to do entry-level digital jobs. We surveyed over 300 students in each of 11 countries and over 100 employers, so about 3,300 students about uh, 1,600 employers and ask them, how do you feel about these industry certificates, these micro-credentials being integrated into college degree programs? What students said, perhaps not surprisingly, in every country that we surveyed, 90% on average said they believe that when they graduate, if they had a college degree and a professional certificate, they would stand out and have a higher chance of getting a job. They also said, students said, that they would be more likely to choose a university or choose a degree program if that degree program integrated industry micro-credentials into the college degree program. So this is what students are thinking. You might be, well, well what do employers think? Because if employers don't really care, then students will not ultimately end up caring either. Well, employers had pretty much the same perception. 88% of employers surveyed in every one of the countries uh, that, we, that we surveyed, it was well over 75%, said that a student who graduates with a college degree and a certificate from industry stands out and is likely going to be more considered for a job opportunity. And almost three out of four employers said that they would be more likely to hire a student with both a degree and an industry micro-credential. So almost everything's gone hybrid. Hybrid learning, where you're online and you're on campus. Hybrid work, where you're working remotely and you're in the office. And now even hybrid credentials, where it's not just earning a college degree, but clearly many people realize that a college degree is still the number one most sought after learning credential in the world. But it doesn't have to be either or. What we're seeing is a collaboration and a hybridization of even credentials like industry micro-credentials and, and uh, college degrees. So you can see today we've announced quite a few of these professional certificates. They're all designed for people who are looking for entry-level digital jobs that are in high demand. They do not require a college degree. They do not require any prior work experience and the skills and certificates can be learned online. We have these certifi certificates across a growing range of job roles in software, IT, data science, and business. Increasingly, we're expanding that to healthcare. 
and we're working with accreditation agencies around the world to certify and recommend these as credit towards a college degree. In the US, we're working with the American Council on Education, who has reviewed for quality and rigor and approved and recommended as credit for prior learning 14 of the professional certificates in this cluster that you see here. And we're also working with the ECTS in Europe. We're working with accreditation agencies in India, in the UAE, in Saudi Arabia, and all around the world. So we're really seeing a lot of government and policymakers also embracing this idea of hybridization of industry and university together to create the best educational experience for individuals. Cumulatively, more than six million learners around the world have enrolled in these professional certificates. In the last year, we announced 20 new certificates. You can see across a wide range of industries from a wide range of industry partners. And today, I'm excited to announce an additional six new entry-level certificates from Akamai, from Fractal, from IBM, and from the real estate firm Keller Williams. Now what I'd love to do is to hear firsthand from one of our industry partners into it, who has developed a professional certificate program to train people to become entry-level bookkeepers and explain a little bit about the program and also why Intuit has embarked on this professional certificate program with Coursera. Let's take a look. So our partnership with Coursera really supports Intuit's mission of powering prosperity because we are giving people educational tools and educational opportunities to gain job skills that will make them attractive to employers. Coursera has paved the way in creating professional certificate programs that are alternatives to a standard college education. And so it's been really valuable to be able to reach those Coursera learners through their platform. The impact of our relationship with Coursera has really been able to diversify our talent pipeline by offering our certificate program to learners who might not have access to traditional educational opportunities. Coursera is aiding our strategic goal of connecting people to experts by helping us grow more experts in the marketplace. We're seeing positive early results that it is working and that the people who complete the program are desirable candidates who we want to hire. So it's very exciting for us to be able to reach those learners, uh, give them the knowledge and skills that they need to be financially successful. I, I love that. Grow more experts and build an expert marketplace. Uh, so it's clearly some really great innovation that we're seeing from our industry partners. I'm sure a lot of our university partners are saying, yeah, but what about us? I mean, clearly there's gotta be a lot of innovation coming out of universities as well. And indeed, there has been quite a bit. Today, our university partners offer more than 50 degrees, master's and bachelor's degrees on Coursera around the world. And I'd love to zoom in on one type of degree that's getting quite a bit of traction. Uh, in the last year, we announced eight new degree programs from a wide range of universities across a number of regions. And today I'm excited to announce another eight new degree programs that will be uh, hosted on Coursera from Ball State University, Illinois Institute of Technology, SP Jane Institute of Management and Research, and University of Colorado Boulder, a master's in computer science. Now let's take a moment and focus in on University of Colorado. Uh, they are doing some pretty interesting things. When we went out and asked learners on platform, on Coursera and also off platform, who were not taking degree programs, these are mostly working adults, we said, why aren't you doing that? A lot of what we heard was, it's expensive. I don't wanna waste my money. It's gonna take a lot of time. I don't necessarily have time. I have a job, I often have a family. I don't know if I spend all this time doing the tests and finding my transcripts and getting letters of recommendation. Like, that's a lot of invested time if I don't get into the program. If I do get in, I'm worried I won't finish because something will come up at work or something's gonna happen with my, with my family. And even if I do finish, I'm worried that I might not get a job and the investment that I've made might not be worth it. So we have been continually working with our university partners to continually adapt the college degree to better meet the needs of working adults. And a great example of this degree design has been pioneered by our partners at the University of Colorado Boulder. 
Uh, there is a degree in uh, data science that is obviously a very hot field, a lot of job prospects. It costs $15,750 for a master's degree. You could start any time for $49 a month. You say, how could you start a degree for $49 a month whenever you want? You start in open content from University of Colorado Boulder. And that content then counts towards the degree and is also the basis of the admissions decision. So people can earn admissions into the degree program based on their performance, not necessarily on their prior educational experience. And then finally, another thing that a lot of learners are looking for is that integration of industry content into the degree program so that these students, when they graduate, have the best of a college degree from a great university and also industry credentials and hands-on projects, a portfolio of projects that they can show to employers to say, yeah, I've got the skills to do this job. The results have been really fairly striking, and we are going to be continuing to push with more and more partners for this degree, degree design that really is well tailored for working adults. And now let's hear from our partners at University of Colorado Boulder talk a little bit about this degree program and why they chose to design it this way. We wanted to remove barriers, bringing high quality education to people who otherwise would not come to campus. Most online learning operates in an 80 mile radius. The MSEE and the MSDS have brought thousands of students to Boulder from around the globe. As partners, they know how to leverage our strengths, redoubling them to a global network. Coursera allows the university to reimagine how it teaches people. We could have these large number of students really doing meaningful homework problems that are technical engineering problems and be machine graded at a massive scale. We modularize the courses and what if we took the whole master's degree and broke it down into units that students could move through in a few weeks so that students could pick and choose and assemble a degree that was useful to them. It truly is a different approach that really increases our applications and our enrollment in the on-campus programs as well. Near on-demand courses, enrollment, grading, all these things that, that really bring the campus into the 21st century. Coursera presents an ecosystem of online education rivaled by no other partner, and a way of thinking about education that allows a way forward the world is changing fast. I think the universities have to adapt, rethink from the ground up. So the innovation is inspiring. The excitement is palpable. And we are seeing incredible things that are happening among our university partners. I think it's just the beginning. What I'd love to show you now are a couple of major advances that we will be bringing to market this year to help our educator partners create with more uh, efficiency and speed content that's going to help learners around the world. One is by integrating generative AI into the course building process. We'll take a look at a prototype uh, in a second. And also some really fast progress that's being made in creating more immersive learning environments using virtual reality, augmented reality, extended reality from a number of our, our, of our top partners. But let's start by welcoming Tatiana to the stage, our, one of our lead designers. Tatiana, hi, nice to see you. Hi. And Tatiana's gonna talk a little bit about a new capability we're developing to build courses using generative AI. Tatiana, can you describe it a little bit? Thank you, Jeff, yep. and hello, everyone. As you know, Jeff, Coursera works with educators and learning and development managers from around the world through our work with our university partners, our Coursera for campus institutions, and our Coursera for business customers. One common theme we hear from all of you is that you are all looking for easier ways to create and curate content that meets the unique needs of your learners while driving learning outcomes through high quality assessments. So in response to your feedback, we are developing a product concept to reduce the time to create high quality courses by building a set of authoring capabilities powered by the exciting latest AI technologies. Here's a preview of what that could look like. All right, Tati, let's take a look. Let's meet Jenny. Jenny wants to help her learners grow their leadership skills. She has some of her own content to get started with, 
and she knows Coursera can take what she has and build an engaging private course in only a few clicks. Here is how we're helping Jenny. She can build her course manually or save time by getting assistance. Coursera's easy authoring helps Jenny build out the content. She can tell her what she wants the course to be about and the skills she wants learners to gain. For example, a leadership course covering skills including communication, team building, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. In addition to her content, Jenny is also looking to include video clips from participating partners to supplement her private course and make it more interesting and relevant for her learners. She can add her files as source materials, such as recordings of previous lectures, training sessions, or written documents like a syllabus or a list of skills. Now, Jenny is ready to generate a course draft. Coursera will analyze her inputs and create the course structure, generate content from her uploads, recommend existing Coursera content to include, and apply pedagogical best practices. Through easy authoring, a first draft of the course was created for Jenny based on the input she gave it, and now she can review and edit the content. There are a few modules, some videos that are from her upload, which were split into shorter clips, alongside videos from other authors, and an auto-generated reading and assignment. Let's take a look at the first video. This is a clip of just the introduction from Jenny's original upload. The preview includes an auto-generated summary derived from the transcript and highlights to jump to each video segment. Jenny can adjust the way the video was trimmed and tweak the summary. She can also edit the generated transcripts and skills that are tagged to this video. She can check out the videos from other participating institutions that were suggested to add to the course. This one looks interesting. Jenny can watch the preview, read the summary, or skip to the highlighted segments of the video to get a quick sense of it. She can also look through other alternatives by telling Coursera what she's looking for, such as finding the most popular videos about Module 1. It suggested three other videos. After previewing them, she can decide which ones to use to supplement her course. Or reading was also auto-generated with a glossary of keywords based on the content in this module. An assignment was auto-generated based on the transcript of the uploaded videos and other content in the module, which is great because it will have taken her a long time to build these from scratch. She can add more questions to create more options for variability. Once Jenny is ready to launch the course, she can review the auto-generated course name, description, skill tags, and logo. Now, Jenny's private custom course is live, and learners at her organization are on their way to growing their leadership skills. Jenny can't believe how easy it was for her to create an engaging private course in Coursera. Our vision is to streamline customized course creation for educators and customers like Jenny using a plan of content to meet learners' unique needs. Tatiana, pretty exciting, obviously very new, but this idea <laughs> of helping customers and partners just create faster, easier courses using expert content is like a big part of our future. It is. Besides all of that, it supports launching the best content across top brands in a single learning experience. All right, so uh, for all the customers and partners who are like, hey, when can I start banging on this thing? What are our plans in terms of making this available? Sure, we are developing a pilot with a set of our content partners that will launch later this year. We'll be sharing more information with our partners and customers in the upcoming months. Today, 
We are recruiting educators and businesses willing to collaborate with us as participants in this pilot program. You can reach out to your representative if you want to join. All right, so we're recruiting for pilots. If you're interested in course building using generative AI, call your representative. Tatiana, thank you so much for thank joining Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Okay, so that's a little bit in terms of using generative AI to help create courses and, and assemble courses using expert content. What I'd like to do now is to shift and look at how other technology, particularly virtual reality, extended reality, uh, augmented reality, is being used by partners to create more immersive learning experiences, to teach concepts in a way that you just can't really do in the physical world. And to introduce this, I'm happy to welcome Pauline to the stage. She's one of our top product managers building our VR platform. And we've got a bunch of courses that are live right now, right? Yeah. So you're gonna tell us about stuff that actually exists today. I am, yeah, everything you're about to see is live on Coursera right now. Um, there are so many studies coming out about how powerful VR can be. That's especially true in education and especially true in online learning where hands-on practice can be pretty limited. Um, and I, I can vouch for how powerful it is. One of the experiences that you're about to see, I actually used to prepare for this very moment and it helped me tremendously. You're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so here's what we built. In partnership with Meta, we first built a platform that allows partners with existing VR to integrate it seamlessly onto Coursera like any other item. And then for partners that don't yet have VR but are interested in it, we have a playbook now that makes it really easy to build VR from scratch. Uh, and so to showcase how powerful this can be, we actually picked three courses on completely different topics and we built multi-level scaffolded experiences for these three courses. Um, the part that I'm really passionate about too is that they're accessible. So of course you can access them through your headset, but you can also access them through your desktop. Mm. Uh, and then this is in addition to the 10 courses that the University of Michigan is infusing immersive learning into. So a lot to show. Are you ready for it? I'm ready. This is real stuff, right? Yep, exactly. Okay. Let's meet Brian. Brian is changing careers and needs to get comfortable presenting in front of an audience. He enrolled in the Introduction to Public Speaking course from the University of Washington. Through VR, he's able to practice his speech in front of an audience and gain personalized, real-time feedback. First, he's able to choose a setting for his speech, whether he wants to practice in a large auditorium or more of a boardroom location, and then he can choose a calm or a restless audience depending on his needs. Here we are backstage, where Brian can practice some calming and prep techniques before going live. And as Brian delivers his speech, the instructor provides real-time feedback on Brian's projection, pitch, gestures, and his overall engagement with the audience, just as a real coach would if he were right there with you. Audience seems a little bit restless. Take a deliberate pause and reset a bit. The pause might help redirect their attention to you. Now, let's meet Jessica. Jessica is taking the Chinese for Beginners course. In real life, it would be difficult for Jessica to practice and get feedback on her pronunciation. But through VR, she's able to meet her friend Min and practice the vocabulary she's learning in the course. Here's Min. Ni hao. Welcome to Beijing. I'm so glad you came to visit and I can't wait to show you around some of my favorite spots. I'll see you soon at Wang Fu Jing Market. Alongside Min, Jessica goes on a scavenger hunt through a Chinese market where she collects objects by saying words correctly, helping her connect images to pronunciations in a really powerful way. Each level presents new real-world interactions with various other people at the market so that Jessica can practice things like ordering food and meeting fellow travelers. As Jessica advances, the activity provides less coaching and support to help her really master the content that she's learning in the course that week. Let's meet Marisol, who is enrolled in the introductory human physiology course from Duke. Marisol, like many other learners enrolled in this course, doesn't have a medical background, but is really interested in understanding the human body. In this experience, the power of VR lets Marisol experience concepts that would otherwise be dangerous or impossible. For example, here she is inside of a blood vessel where she can expand and constrict the vessel to see the impact that has on the blood flow. As she progresses through the course, Marisol learns all the functions that take place when measuring somebody's blood pressure. 
she's able to practice taking a friend's blood pressure, where she's guided through when to constrict the arm, when to measure, and how to interpret the results. Now, we know that it can require a lot of resources to create a VR learning experience, so we're working to make that easier for our partners. Partners with existing VR experiences can integrate those through our VR portal. For partners who are interested in how VR can solve learner pain points for them, but haven't developed an experience yet, we've worked with a vendor and built out a process to help you navigate the VR journey. All you need to do is provide one subject matter experts and one great idea and the vendor team can bring the whole process from beginning to real life. But most importantly, we want to work with you to understand how VR can drive better outcomes for our learners. We've built a VR experience analytics dashboard to help you track and understand the engagement and success of your experiences. You can see how learners are accessing the platforms, if it's on desktop or headset, and where they're getting stuck and ultimately how this is impacting their understanding of the content they've learned through your course. In addition to these virtual reality capabilities, one of our longstanding partners, the University of Michigan, is pioneering the use of extended reality in a series of 10 courses across a variety of professional disciplines, like this one about the future of mobility and autonomous vehicles. Let's take a look at another one in depth. Kai is a learner on Coursera, studying to be a medical assistant and learns that bias in healthcare leads to worse patient outcomes and worse patient care. He wants to make sure he's equipped to recognize and address bias in the workplace to be able to provide the best care possible. In the Advancing Health Equity course from the University of Michigan, Kai is immersed in a situation where he witnesses Alton, a black man seeking mental health services, experience a series of microaggressions. Kai first watches the scene unfold naturally and can then revisit each scene from the perspective of Alton himself to learn how each of these interactions affects Alton. Each experience up to now has had a cumulative effect on me. The immersive experience helps Kai consider multiple perspectives and roles and use empathy to analyze bias. With so many opportunities in immersive learning, how will you use it to bring hands-on experiences to your learners? All right, Paulina, so you asked, how will you use it? I'm sure a lot of our partners are saying, this is happening, it's happening pretty fast. Mm -hmm. How can they get started with these types of immersive experiences using this technology? Oh, that's a great question. I have so much empathy for that question. When we started this journey at Coursera, we didn't know where to start. We didn't know what technology was available. We didn't know what content lends itself to VR. So as we've built all of this and as we've put so much thought into it, we've built out a playbook. So from start to finish, what does it take? What does it look like? What technologies are available and what content should you target to build out VR? And we really wanna partner with you to create those VR experiences in a much lighter lift than from scratch. Um, I think the other thing to think about is we've showcased VR, but there's other options, right? There's augmented reality, there's these 360 videos. It can be much less of a lift than full-fledged VR immersive experiences. Um, but if you are interested in full VR, uh, Coursera now has a catalog that you can reuse of assets to make it quicker and cheaper to build out VR. Great, so th think of Coursera as your immersive learning partner, a resource center, if you will, to start bringing learning experiences into the virtual world. Absolutely. Melina, thank you, very exciting stuff. Take care. Okay, so there's a little bit about how technology is changing, not just the ability to generate new content, but to create new types of experiences in a way that harnesses assets that have been built and infrastructure that has been built to make it easier and more accessible, not just to the learner, but also to the institutions. Speaking of institutions, on the final piece of the triangle here, let's go through a couple of case studies, I guess three, one in business, one in campus, one in government, to talk about the role that institutions are playing in bringing our partners' content and credential to the world of learners that are out there. One I'd like to highlight from the business world, one of our Coursera for business customers is Sanofi. And they are, like many businesses, using our partners' content to upskill and reskill their employees, but they've gone a step further. They're actually taking the Career Academy with the professional certificates and making it available to those in the broader Paris uh, community who maybe didn't have access to this kind of learning opportunity, maybe want to work at Sanofi but don't have the skills. Uh, basically, Sanofi is investing in the community to help them get the skills to apply for a job. And if you don't get a job at Sanofi, you'll at least have the skills to perhaps get a job 
someplace else. So it's really part of their corporate social responsibility, the way that they're extending learning beyond the walls of their own organization. Uh, in terms of Coursera for Campus, here's a great example. One of the leading universities in Vietnam, FPT University, they are very innovative in integrating online content and credentials from our industry and university partners into their on-campus programs. They have decided that 20% of all credit hours for every student on campus should be learned online. So far, their students have completed more than 5 million lessons and over 1.5 million hours of learning. So this is, in reality, the integration of online and on campus and the collaboration of the world's best universities and industry leaders with universities around the world. And then finally, on the government side, I was very honored to meet with the president of Kazakhstan in New York a few months ago. And then the Minister of Education came out to California. And what we have put together is a relationship where the government has decided that the best way to upskill their citizens is to upskill entire educational systems. So they have decided to basically use Coursera and put it into not, not one university, but every public university in the country. And so students, more than 20,000 students across 25 different universities will have access to some of the best content and credentials uh, in the world. And they're actually gonna be translating a, a number of these courses into Kazakh so that it will be more accessible to the students in that country. And as I talk with uh, heads of state and with ministers of education, this is gonna be a common pattern. Governments will come in and actually make available from a policy perspective, pave the way, and from a funding perspective, start creating financing to help supplement the curricular offerings of university systems in regions around the world. So we are really thrilled by the role that governments are playing in helping make upskilling, reskilling, and job opportunities more equally available to all of their citizens. Which brings me to the final point of my keynote here, which is connecting learners to job opportunities. I mentioned that kind of stage one of Coursera was connecting educators with individuals. Stage two was connecting educators to institutions, businesses, governments, and campuses. Stage three is connecting learners to jobs. It's one thing to create the opportunity for everyone to learn these skills. It's another thing to actually help them connect that skills, that knowledge, those credentials to new job opportunities. And this is where we are really pointing a lot of our effort. Um, I showed you last year, Career Academy, the professional certificates that are job aligned, increasingly getting integrated into degree programs. These are training programs with credentials for people who want to uh, land a new entry level digital job. They include portfolios of hands-on projects to learn the digital tools of the trade and also to build a portfolio that you can show to employers who are increasingly hiring based on skills. So this was kind of the learning and development portion of connecting learners to jobs. Now let's talk about something that we are launching today called Coursera Hiring Solutions to connect learners who have the knowledge and skills to these emerging global job opportunities. And for that, I'm happy to welcome to stage Raina, who's one of our top product managers building Coursera Hiring Solutions. Raina, welcome. Thanks, Jeff. What are we gonna see here? So really excited to show you. Um, we're launching Coursera Hiring Solutions to make it easier for learners to showcase their skills and get discovered by recruiters who are hiring for entry-level jobs. They can do this by building a skills profile that highlights what they've learned on Coursera, which they can then share with prospective employers. And on the employer side, Coursera Hiring Solutions helps recruiters differentiate candidates for entry-level roles, even when they don't have experience in the field yet. It also gives recruiters access to an untapped, job-ready talent pool who have all the skills they need to succeed in the workplace. And it helps them create a more equitable hiring process. With that, I can't wait to show you what we've been working on. Great, let's take a look. Let's meet Priyanka. She's a Coursera for Campus learner who studies computer science at a university in central India. Priyanka's in her final year and starting to think about her first job out of school. As a soon-to-be grad, Priyanka has an idea of the career she wants, but still needs to build the hands-on skills required for an entry-level role. She also needs to make sure that she stands out compared to other candidates. Here's how we're helping Priyanka. It all starts on Coursera's Career Academy. Priyanka wants to build on her computer science degree with a career in data science, so she explores the data analyst role. 
And now, with Coursera Hiring Solutions, Priyanka can not only learn about the role she wants, but she can also see the steps she needs to take to get there. And Coursera can help with each one. Priyanka can develop job-ready skills with a professional certificate, practice relevant tools, and demonstrate her skills with real-world projects. And each step that Priyanka completes as part of her career journey, she's adding to her Coursera skills profile. Over time, her profile becomes a showcase for the skills she's developed. And the best part is it's easily discovered by recruiters actively using Coursera Hiring Solutions to find talent for entry-level roles. So let's take a look at how that works. Meet Arash. He's a recruiter with an ambitious goal of hiring 100 entry-level data analysts and software engineers this year. But it's not only about the numbers. Arash is looking for candidates who are really poised to succeed in his company, and he'd like to increase the diversity of his company's candidate pool to help them meet their DEI objectives. However, campus recruiting is competitive, costly, and time-consuming. Graduates all look the same on paper, making spotting qualified talent like finding a needle in a haystack. This year, Arash is trying something new. Enter Coursera Hiring Solutions. It all starts on the landing page. From here, Arash can see the roles offered and the number of available candidates for each one. First, he chooses to view the candidates who are available for the entry-level data analyst role. On this dashboard, Arash can see the candidates who've indicated that they're interested in this role. It gives an overview of basic details like their educational background and whether they're from an underrepresented group based on that role in the region. It also shows the candidate's skill proficiency based on how they scored on a role-aligned skills assessment. Arash can also see the learning they've completed on Coursera, such as professional certificates, courses, and projects. There's a lot of candidates here. So Arash can filter down the list to meet his unique requirements for the role. For example, he could set a threshold for the overall job-aligned assessment score. He can filter candidates based on the specific skills they've developed. He can even select to preview underrepresented candidates. Now Arash has a list of candidates that meet his unique sourcing requirements, but he still wants to dig deeper into their skills and background. The candidate at the top of the list is Priyanka, and Arash can learn more about her skills by clicking View Profile. From here, he can see all her relevant qualifications in one place. Digging deeper, Arash can find a detailed breakdown of Priyanka's individual skill proficiencies based on a role-aligned skills assessment that she completed as part of her profile. Moving on, he can also see projects that she's completed. These help him understand how well she can apply her skills in real world on the job scenarios. The project overview includes findings and recommendations in Priyanka's own words. This helps Arash evaluate non-technical skills like how she communicates, solves problems, and thinks critically. And finally, he can assess her technical aptitude using the coding artifact that's included with her project. In the education section, Arash can see that Priyanka has completed a Google Data Analyst Professional Certificate. The summary of the skills she developed in that program, along with the backing of Google's brand, helped to boost his confidence that Priyanka is well qualified for the role that he's hiring. At the bottom of the profile, he can view all of the learning that Priyanka has completed on Coursera. With over a thousand learning hours, Priyanka's profile definitely stands out. This data, combined with a record of other achievements, clearly tells recruiters like Arash that she's dedicated to her growth and development. And it's enough to convince Arash. At this point, he's confident that Priyanka is job ready and that she'll be able to onboard quickly at his company. All that's left now is for him to send her a personalized invitation to apply for the job. Priyanka receives a message from Arash and the recruiting process begins. 
All right, Raina, that looks pretty good. I've been talking throughout this whole keynote about creating opportunity, not just for learning, but also job opportunities. How is this going to help learners get better access to a broader set of jobs? Absolutely. So we believe that Coursera Hiring Solutions creates opportunities for our learners in two really powerful ways. One, the new skills profile helps them get discovered by recruiters based on their abilities and their job readiness, not whether they have a traditional education or employment history. And secondly, the talent dashboard presents these candidates directly to recruiters as an untapped pool of diverse talent. We're really just excited to build a more equitable hiring process and bring career opportunities to more learners around the world. Raina, thanks a ton. Really exciting. Thank and you. when will learners actually start getting access to these skills profiles so they can get this connection that we're looking for? So we've rolled out um, for a pilot in India now. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're interested, please contact your representative. Um, we're really excited. Good. All right. Thanks, Raina. Thank you. Thank you. So that's going to be, I mean, this is going to be a multi-year effort, obviously. But I think the next logical step after helping prepare students with the knowledge and the skills and the credentials is to show them the opportunities. I believe that online learning, which provides a great way to get access to excellent content and credentials, will become more and more valuable over time because the range of opportunities to make that investment of time and money worth it are going to get broader and broader as these opportunities become more and more global. So I'm really excited to make our partners' content and credential even more valuable by presenting the benefits on a much more global scale to the learning that learners do. Now, before I wrap up, I want to talk about one other kind of institution, and these are our nonprofit and community partners. We work with them in order to serve populations who otherwise might not have access to the funding or other types of support that would be required to make sure that they get the benefit of access to the knowledge and the credentials and the projects and everything else that we've been talking about. I'm happy to say that working with our nonprofit and community partners, today we've served cumulatively over 200,000 learners with more than a million course enrollments in our partners' content and credentials. So to wrap up, um, I put Imagine here. The, uh, Imagine is the beginning of a prompt for a generative uh, AI image-based uh, program called Midjourney. So, Generative AI is not just about text. It's doing text, it's doing audio, it's doing images, it's doing video. And it's all going to be doing this better and better and better. I asked Midjourney to create a picture of this talk. I said, generate a picture that represents a network of human neurons and machine learning nodes in a world that is changing but achieving balance and harmony through collaboration. Ah, do you know what that looks like? This is what I thought it looked like. I didn't touch this. I just asked the machine to create that. And that's the picture that came up. So I think it's emblematic of this future that we cannot, we cannot really predict. I mean, adaptability is what's going to be required for every learner. And I think for us, we have a chance that is becoming more and more real every day to take this quote here, that talent is equally distributed, but opportunity is not, and change that. I love getting here every year and saying, look at the progress we're making. We're making real progress, and we have new tools with technology to make this progress happen even more quickly. But we're going to do this together. I would say technology, innovation, and collaboration will be the only way that we can really continue to serve the world through learning. So thank you for coming today. Thank you for being our partners. Without our partners, Coursera would not exist. Without our learners, Coursera would not exist. We think of this as a community, and I am very grateful to have a part to play uh, in this community. So thank you for coming. And now uh, we'll take questions with Trena, our Chief Learning Officer. Trena, hello. Hi, Jeff. Nice to see you. Wow. Thank you for bringing to life for us what an exciting time this is for our learners, our partners, and really the whole field of learning and education. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. It is amazing. So Coursera community, we have a lot to unpack here. Jeff went through some compelling research talking about ChatGPT. He shared some exciting developments about degrees and the offerings on the platform, and shared some game-changing products that are coming out soon from Coursera. Terrific questions have been rolling in. There's still time to ask yours, and we'll try to hit as many as we can. These are live questions, Trent? These are live questions. All right, let's go. So you ready yeah. for whatever may yeah. come your way? Yeah. All right, let's start. First question, Maliha asked, is there any research taking place highlighting the best way to assess 
student outcomes, keeping in mind chat GPT? You know, I, I, can I get you a lifeline? I can ask all of our <laughs> university partners here in the audience. Um, I think that most of that kind of research is more likely going to be happening on campus where our university partners are much closer to where the alumni gets placed. Mm -hmm. I'd say that right now, generative AI is so new that most universities, uh, both our partners and customers in Coursera for Campus are like trying to figure out what is this thing? How does it work? How should our students be using it? Maybe how shouldn't our students be using it? I'd say it's too, it's too early yet to figure out um, kind of what the job placement impact is. But what I can definitely say to the person that asked the question, it's going to be a big part of every single person's job. Maybe not every. I was looking at that. That, that open AI research said that slaughterhouses and stonemasons <laughs> are not likely to be exposed to generative uh, language models, but pretty much yeah. every uh, job that is you know, sort of in a corporate office is, is going to be impacted. So I would say you know, stay tuned. We're still at the very beginning of this. Well, the good news is we have so many offerings on the platform, but I think those are two areas we may not have covered. Not yet. We have virtual reality. Not Who yet. knows? Okay. <laughs> okay, our next question from Pavritha. I'm really curious to understand. Oh, this is a tough one. Okay. I'm dear to my heart. I'm really curious to understand the future for HR and organizational psychology professionals in this dynamic digital era. Is the field already obsolete? I think the field is just warming up. I mean, here, here's a, I'm on a compensation committee, so we do a lot of studies of like how much are different people getting paid and which positions are getting the biggest boost. Turns out, chief human resource officers are seeing dramatic increases in pay. Now, why? I would argue that in a world of uncertainty, being a leader is very, very difficult. I, I argue sort, sort of from personal experience, but it's true. I mean, almost all the companies, all the managers, all the universities, That's everyone I'm talking about. Helping organizations, groups of people, move through change is hard enough. Moving through change when the end state is not clear is very difficult. To the extent that organizations need to adapt, leaders will become very important to help articulate a vision and move people through these periods of uncertainty and change. And I would argue that HR is the support for, for an organization that needs to learn, change, and grow. The only path to success for an organization will be an agile organization where people are ready to deal with uncertainty. People are ready to adapt, and they'll adapt by learning new skills, new tools, new people, new teamwork modes. I mean, there's so much new things that's gonna be happening. I think HR is gonna be absolutely essential. I highly recommend it. You're speaking my language as an HR professional, so thank you, okay. thank you. And I think so much opportunity for HR in this space. Okay, our next question, an audience member here with us today asked, it looks like AI will help create new course content very quickly. Where does that leave the role of instructors and institutions? Uh, a few things. I would say that it's going to, you know, generative AI is going to help create a lot of content. Most of that's going to be very bad for society and very bad for the world, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Because the, the effectiveness of content, you know, whether that's a tweet or whether that's a blog post or whatever, to manipulate and misinform people has never, this is like a you know, ma tool of mass destruction to cr like create really, really bad stuff out there in order to manipulate people. I also think when you look at uh, language, was that generated by a computer, is that real or not? You look at images, that, that one of the Pope with the white parka, like is that real or not? Being able to distinguish what content is real and what content is purely made up, especially by malicious actors, will be very difficult. I suspect that what's gonna happen is the role of trusted institutions is gonna become more important, not less. I think it's not just overflowing people with information, but having pedagogies that help people exercise their brain muscle is gonna be really important. You know, I was an English major, so I'm a little bit biased here, but a lot of my thinking was clarified through writing thinking about ideas and how you transfer a concept I learned over here to a novel situation and context over here requires like, I don't know exactly how they do it, but the little neurons connect. I'm like, oh, look, there is actually a relationship between this concept and this application of the concept. Well, if you use generative AI to say, how are these two concepts related? And it's just like, well, here's one idea. But you never really go through the process and the hard work of doing that. I worry that people's critical thinking, creativity, an ability for far transfer could be compromised. I think it's the role of educators to design programs, teach durable concepts, and the ability to apply those concepts critically into novel contexts 
will be increasingly important. So again, I'm pretty bullish. I actually think that our partners and what we're doing will be more important than ever in a world of generative AI. So partners, Coursera community, this is a gentleman who uses ChatGPT daily, who believes in the power of it, understands it, and sees that there is no replacement of the importance of our institutions. I kind of understand it. Nobody understands. I mean, here's <laughs> one of the scary things, too. These are all emergent capabilities. The engineers who built it did not predict it was going to be able to do what it does. And when they're working on GPT-5, someone's probably playing with an elaborate now, maybe GPT-6 is somewhere along the way. I know Google's working on BARD. What's coming is coming so fast with capabilities that are really difficult to predict. It's a little bit like the human brain. Like once you get a certain density of neurons in your prefrontal cortex, you start talking about your own like self-narrative. How does that happen? We still don't really know where human consciousness comes from. I don't know, I'm not saying these things are conscious right now, but we just don't know exactly how these are gonna behave. And at the rate of improvement, it's, it's, it's really difficult to know. So you're right. I mean, I play around with it a lot, but no one's got the answers. An exciting journey. Yeah, yeah. Okay, next question. Ambrose asked, the digital world is providing equal opportunities and learning by allowing those in developing countries to access world-class education from around the world. But how can these people be helped with access to the internet so they can truly keep up? Uh, governments, governments. Uh, a lot of what governments are responsible for is building basic infrastructure, whether that's water, whether that's health systems, whether that's educational systems, whether that's electricity. Um, that, that's kind of what has to happen. The good news is, I, when I was in Davos, met with the new head of the ITU, which is basically all the ministers of information technology around the world. Uh, and she has really laid out a plan where ministries of IT are laying all the infrastructure for broadband, uh, whether those are backbones going down the spine of the Yucatan Peninsula, which I saw when I was down there, uh, or whether that's broadband 5G. Uh, the, the good news is everybody is real. Everybody uh, who needs to be aware of this, like in the, in, the, in, in government and infrastructure projects, they know that getting access to the internet is incredibly important. One of the things I really like is that virtually every course on Coursera runs on a mobile phone. Uh, videos are a little bit data intensive, so it's better to be on a Wi-Fi hotspot, but you could do it remotely. You could take all these courses and do that offline. It's a huge part of the access. A nice thing that some people don't appreciate, a, a big difference between Zoom and generative AI, at least language AI, is that with Zoom, it's very device intensive. And because it's real time, the bandwidth requirements are very high. Mm -hmm. There's a much bigger digital divide when it comes to real time high bandwidth video than there is with using generative AI. Generative AI is essentially ASCII text that you send to a server, a bunch of computations happens, at least with respect to language, and then, and then the text comes out. You could use a mobile device, it's almost no uh, memory, almost no data usage. Okay. With uh, machine learning translations, the ability for any speaker of any language to be able to you know, incorporate, uh, learn from virtually any expert is gonna go up. So I think that the infrastructure is getting put in place. I think the cost of compute's coming down. I think some of these most, uh, the most innovative new technologies are actually pretty low device intensive, they're pretty energy intensive, but they're pretty low device intensive. So I think so long as you have the infrastructure uh, and, and a really good K through 12 educational system. I always say governments have to do two things if you wanna make sure that this doesn't create more inequality. Number one, make sure you have the infrastructure and access to the internet, not just for learning, but for the jobs. Number two, you've gotta have a good K through 12 education system. Because if there's not basic literacy, basic access to education, understanding how to take advantage of all these great courses is just gonna be, I think, a leap too far. And Jeff, you've been on the road meeting with governments all over the world. Are these topics coming up? All the time. Great. All the time. I was in DC two weeks ago. Um, AI, privacy rights, uh, uh, the, the CHIPS Act, the infrastructure bill, laying broadband through rural uh, the US. I mean, awesome. in, in almost every country, Terrific. everyone is, they're clued in. Okay, wonderful. All right, we're gonna take our last question. Those of you who asked questions and we haven't been able to answer them, don't worry, the Coursera team will reach out to you and answer those questions, but we'll ask one more live. Mary Lou asked, if a student asks ChatGPT to make their assignment, is this considered plagiarism? From my point of view, it would not be good practice. How are institutions prepared to face these changes? It's coming fast. Um, I've seen some of the documents that some of our partners right here in the audience have put together, very thoughtful pieces about, for students, that says, 
this is our policy with respect to you know, generative AI. Um, a lot of them are very clear that in certain circumstances, this is an acceptable tool to use, kind of a thinking tool that you can use. Make sure you attribute it. In other circumstances, you're not supposed to use this tool. And so you know, how we change assessments and change the way people are assessed might need to change. Um, but it really kind of differs from institution to institution. I think almost every employer I talk to says, no, I need graduates to know how to use these tools. If you have a graduate that like, doesn't know how to use a calculator and doesn't know how to use Google, they're going to struggle in the workplace. Well, similarly, if you, like, if you don't know how to use these generative AI tools, you're, you're not going to be very effective in the work. At the same time, it is possible in a way that you cannot do with a calculator or Google to sort of outsource your thinking, at least the first draft of your thinking, to a computer. That's going to be the thing I think is a bit different. That's where I think when people say, oh, this is just like Google, it's, it's not, Google search. It's not just like Google search. When Google has Bard, it's doing a lot more than just giving you information. It's helping you synthesize information. And with that information th synthesis, to some degree, is a bit of thinking synthesis. So it's still early days. The best universities are putting out good policies. I would just say, if you generate something as a student and you use ChatGPT to do it, attribute it. But it's good to learn the tool. OK, fantastic. Well, thank you all for your questions and for your engagement. There's a lot more content to come, so please stay with us. Up next, we have Outstanding Achievement Awards. And Jeff, I'll put you on the spot. One word to describe this next coming year in the field of learning and education from your perspective. I would say daunting. No. Um, <laughs> exhilarating. I mean, like daunting and exhilarating are almost, they're very closely related terms. After. I think it's going to be really, really exciting. I tell you what I love. I love the changes creating opportunity. I really do believe that together, we're making good progress to take that change and turn it into opportunity and at least try to mitigate the threat of, of missing something really important. So I'm really thankful to be here with this community because I think together we're making good progress. And if I had to sum up your, your speech today, I would say honesty and optimism. Yeah, fair enough, thank today. you. Thanks, Great, Anna. thank you all for joining us. Thank you.